in the winter of 1988. Bodies began appearing on the border between my town and the surrounding woods. A group of campers had stumbled upon a man in his early 30s, completely nude and almost perfectly preserved by the cold weather. By the end of the day, two more had been found within a quarter mile radius. All three were naked, all lying on the ground, as if there had been no attempt to hide them. One woman and two men. None bore any visible wounds. The news exploded. It was a little backwoods town where not much happened. So when three strangers turned up dead, hardly a mile off of Ravel Street, it became all anyone could talk about. I was just a kid then, a few months into sixth grade, and the rumors that spread around school were ridiculous. Family breakfast that morning was quieter than usual. Mom was horrified, poring over the newspaper as she wondered aloud, if it was safe to send my eight-year-old sister and me to school by ourselves. Jesus, she said, gesturing to the paper. Look at this, Michael. They put their photos in. That's just not decent. Dad glanced over. I bet you it's drugs. All fuss is for nothing. Can I see? I asked, reaching out to take the paper from my mom. She pursed her lips. Fine, but don't show Maddie. I grabbed it and looked it over. Three grainy pictures of nondescript faces. Kind of disappointing, though I didn't dare say that out loud. While Mom was washing the dishes, I let my sister have a peek. Maddie stuck her tongue out and she looked them over. This one looks like William, she giggled, pointing at the leftmost photo. A man with dark hair and a rasp of stubble. He's a boy in my class. He was so innocently morbid that I couldn't help but laugh. I got up to help Mom with the dishes, though, even as I occupied myself with chores. I couldn't help but linger on the strange deaths. My dad insisted there was a logical explanation for it all. Three young people, drunk and stumbling, lost in the woods, in a below-zero night. Well, he said, you can imagine what happened next. In the following week, he was proven wrong. The autopsy was published. No trace of drugs, medicinal or otherwise, in their blood. No alcohol, either. The cause of death couldn't be ascertained. There had been no physical trauma. No blood loss, no pre-existing medical conditions. The article in the newspaper declared it most certainly resembled death by shock. A sudden, massive rush of adrenaline essentially stunning the heart into... inaction. That only seemed to open up more questions. One person might have been explainable, but three? What's enough to shock three people like that? A chunk of the woods has already been put under police patrol when a new body turned up, nude yet unharmed like the others. It had been snowing pretty heavily that winter, blanketing the woods in a thick white layer, and at night, I'd lay awake and think of how awful it was to die like that. Freezing and alone with only the shadows of trees stretching out over you. Before the week was over, there was a fifth body, sprawled in almost the exact same spot. Somehow... Nobody had seen where it'd come from. One police officer interviewed by the press said that he'd been passing through the area just minutes prior, and in the time that he was gone, it was like it just... linked into existence. A fresh wave of rumors emerged at school, though now they were less nervously excited, more tinged with fear. Though the evidence was frustratingly non-existent, the unspoken consensus was that they had to be murders. When a sixth body popped up, a 10 p.m. curfew was imposed on adults and children alike. If I remember correctly, that was around the time the FBI caught wind of the case. The whole stretch of forest had already been corned off by the police tape. The perimeter consistently surveyed by a flock of solemn-looking officers who made sure no one got in or out. I used to play in that forest all the time with my friends. Seeing it suddenly made into the sight of six bloodless deaths. Surreal, to say the least. That was what the media started calling it. The bloodless murders. Sometimes the bodies came in pairs, sometimes alone. By the 10th or 11th, there was a definite pattern. While they varied in ethnicity and sex, they were all relatively young. 20s to 40s, and all found nude. Some even looked as if they'd had clothes on minutes before with the indention of a watch or wristband still etched into the skin at the time of discovery. 
Have you ever been in a room where everyone's holding their breath? Every person just waiting for the ball to drop. Silence so bad that you could almost drown in it. Now imagine a whole town. You want to know the strangest part about all this? Weeks dragged on, and none of the bodies were ever identified. Their fingerprints were intact, but there was no known matches. DNA tests came back empty. A public campaign to find the identities of the bloodless victims turned up nothing. It was like these people had emerged from nowhere. Deprived of their names and backstories, the victims were unmourned, blurred into one murky entity. Shit really hit the fan about a month into the case. Some up-and-coming journalist, a guy by the name of Walton, I think, claimed to have uncovered the truth behind it all, and wrote a tell-all article divulging the details that hadn't been released by police or the FBI. Apparently, the bloodless murders weren't so bloodless after all. It was true that most of them were found untouched, but four of the dead practically had bites taken out of them. Whole sections of their bodies were just gone. One guy was missing almost half his right side, and one of the women was short an arm. Bites. Might be a little misleading, although. The missing pieces had been removed cleanly, almost too cleanly. In Walton's words, they looked as if they'd been scooped out or simply magicked away. Walton claimed that he had the records to prove the area was under even more intense surveillance than most would have guessed. Besides hundreds of cameras that had been covertly installed in trees, rocks throughout the forest and such, there was also loads of temperature data loggers and state-of-the-art recording equipment, along with a whole host of other devices that couldn't even wrap my head around. Stuff that measured radiation, minute changes in the compositions of the air. If he was right, it must have cost a ton. Supposedly, the data showed climatological deviations. Basically, weird spikes and dips in temperature and corresponding to the times that the bodies were found. If Walton was right, there was a good chance that the FBI was in possession of video and audio recording showing the origin of the bodies. It sounded like a crazy conspiracy, even though Walton hadn't been able to come up with a solid theory for the reason behind the cover-ups. That was the part that drove me crazy. I must have reread that article a hundred times. What happened next was total lockdown. The newspaper was pulled from publications in the blink of an eye. Walton publicly apologized for having made fabricated claims and trying to make a spectacle out of the deaths. Not much was heard from him after that. The case was under the full jurisdiction of the FBI. According to my parents and uh, local police were all but shut out of it. I don't know what happened exactly, but suddenly the media coverage dropped to zero. At school, the teachers gave a talk about it, how we were all safe and there was to be no further spreading of rumors. I remember thinking about the weirdness of the whole day. While Mr. Russell was going on and on about the importance of following the curfew, there had been a team of adults who quietly escorted kid after kid out of the room, ushering each one back in about ten minutes later. One of them was my friend Sophia. After the assembly, I quizzed her about what had happened over lunch. Stale pizza. It was really weird, she said, picking half-heartedly at her food. He took a sample of my spit, some of my hair and nails, too. You think they're checking for disease? I didn't know how to answer, huh? The whole thing left a sour taste in my mouth, and I felt helpless and scared. Parents must have, must have been encouraged not to talk about it either, because whenever I brought it up to my mom and dad after the whole Walton fiasco had gone down, it shut me down fast. In hindsight, I probably never should have attempted the plan. On a Friday night, I snuck out after curfew, armed with only a handful of granola bars and a flashlight. I biked down the woods. It didn't take long. It was one of those childhood routes that you know by heart. I wasn't even sure about what I was hoping to find. Chalk it up to the mix of curiosity and senselessness. There were patrols standing around, but I managed to make my way to the dense copse of trees and snuck in from there feeling my heart racing a hundred miles an hour as I, as I ducked under the yellow police tape. The sheer stupidity of my idea hadn't quite settled in yet. If what Walton had written about the surveillance had been true, there wasn't a chance at hell that I wasn't going to get spotted, but being a kid and all, I hoped... I hoped I'd get off with a slap on the wrist. I turned my flashlight on in the dimmest setting and began my trek, praying that I knew the path through the woods as well as I thought. 
Time passed differently that night. Maybe I was walking around for 30 minutes, maybe it was 3 hours. The sky was inky black. And in the darkness, the trees distorted themselves into more and more monstrous forms with each step that I took. All I know is, when I stumbled across the body, the world came to a shuddering halt. Under the cone of artificial light, the body looked fresh. The skin still pink. I remember thinking if I touched him, he might have still been warm. His eyes were wide open, glassy as a river, face set in an expression of determination. There was a, there was a tattoo on his bare chest, a sentence written in a shaky scrawl. It comes on July 11th, 2036. So what are we doing? Okay. Uh, you want to just wing it? Good. Your country's always turned out great. You're a country star. I'm a rock star. Okay. Okay. I have no idea what we're supposed to do. All right. Like you're a country just star, I'm a rock star. Come I'm like, up okay. with a name for your. What's your country star's country star name? Oh, dude, I'm Mr. Country Pasta. Must Mr. Country. And I'm Apollo. Iceland. You get like a cool... <laughs> Apollo Iceland? Yeah. Fuck it, I'd probably listen to Apollo Iceland. Lead, lead singer of the rock band. I thought their band was Apollo Iceland. Oh no, that's my name. <laughs> lead singer of the rock band, uh... uh gun Sex. Actually, I'm pretty sure that's a real thing. Okay, lead singer of the rock band, uh... Gun Sex? Slashing onions. <laughs> Sexing onions. Sex, sex and onions. Yeah. Okay. Right. Ready? No, I right. don't know what I'm going to be saying. <laughs> like, I get Hi. my character. Okay. Hi, I'm Apollo Iceland. Rock on! Lead singer of the rock band Slashing Onions. Uh, and and I'm, I'm the country singer, Mr. Country Pasta. And we're here to talk to you today about something that's very special in our hearts. Uh, deep down in the heart of Texas. That is the Creepy Pasta comic book. It rocks! It, it uh, certainly does that. <laughs> <laughs> sure! That's like the weirdest fucking promo! When I'm not sexing groupies in the tour bus, I'm reading these incredible pages and admiring <laughs> okay hold on when I'm not sex and groupies in the tour bus I'm reading this incredible book admiring the fantastic art and marveling at the stupendous story now, I know stupendous isn't really a thing you'd expect a rock star to say but I'm Apollo Iceland rock on yeah you tell him, Mr. Country Pasta. I ain't doing a whole bunch of reading, but shucks howdy, he's got pictures. You can pick up the Creepy Pasta comic book at creepypastacomic.com and make sure to check out my new album, Apollo. It's just called Apollo. Okay. <laughs> it's just called Apollo. <laughs> This is stupid. That's all we need to do. Something like that. It's such a dumb <laughs> promo. What? That's, 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 a, pro. that's the type of shit that's gonna like get a bunch of likes. You know? It's just called a power. <laughs> <laughs>